Yes. Um, let's see here. So this talk started, um, well, at least the, the topic for it started in 2015 when I was at a a meeting with a person named Jim Otteson, who some of you know, he's a Adam Smith scholar, and we were debating whether or not education is sort of a public good, a private good, both. And Otteson maintained, oh, no, that's a private good. Basically, you internalize the benefits of your education. If you choose right, you make more money. If you choose badly, you make less money or get more career satisfaction or whatever. And I said, no, 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 no. come on. Like, education clearly has spillover effects, negative and positive externalities. It's public good, at least in part. And that's separate than the question of whether it should be publicly provided. And that's why I wrote this. Um, one quick caveat, since Paige Harden is at the University of Texas and maybe in the Zoom, I'm not sure. But she just wrote a book that a lot of people are reading, the book. Um, and one thing I want to concede to people like Paige is that, and Paige is a behavior geneticist here, what education can't do, I think it's pretty clear at this point, is alter our basic capacities, right? It's not going to make you a lot smarter in the sense of your intellectual capacity or give you fundamentally different personality traits. Those are highly heritable. It can affect those, but it's not going to fundamentally transform them. So I think when we're talking about education, we're talking about concrete skills. We're talking about literacy, numeracy, critical thinking, as it's sometimes called. And maybe a bit of, you can't actually boost IQ for sure with education, but there are limits to that. So I just wanted to sort of concede that caveat at the beginning, um, precisely because of people like Paige Harden. Okay, so let me get started here. So the first person to, uh -oh, this is frozen now. Maybe the percentage we... oh, Maybe if I do that manually. Okay. Good. So the first person to uh, coin the term public good mm -hmm even though it's a much older concept, it goes at least back to Plato, is Paul Samuelson. So here's a quote, a couple of quotes from him. Private consumption good, like bread, is one whose total can be parceled out among two or more persons, one man having less if another gets more. That's the concept of rivalry, right? So a rival resource is one, the consumption of which, if one consumes more, then one has less. The second one, um, a public consumption good, this is another complementary definition, like an outdoor circus, national defense, you know, maybe a fireworks show. It's provided um, as long as each whatever benefits according to his taste. And he says, I assume a public good can be varied in total quantity, differs from a private good in that each person's consumption is related by a condition of equality. This is the idea of, um, of uh, sorry, non-excludability. So if one person has access, they can't exclude another person from having access to the good. So this is the modern concept, update a few decades. We've really got this four part chart here. Um, and that is a public good is one that is non-excludable and non-rival. Everyone knows that in this room, a private good is excludable and rival. So these are examples here. Um, one of the things that I wanna push back on though is this distinction is not really found in nature per se. It's not a natural fact about an item that it's a public or a private good. It often depends on the cost and availability of technologies that can exclude people for non-payment, right? So you can think about, for example, a country club. Is that a private good or a, a public good? Well, it's often called a club good actually, but is it fully non-excludable? And the answer is no, you can just have better and better technology to try to keep people out. but. You know, when I was a kid, we'd jump over the wall at the Beverly Hills Com Country Club and just swim there in the middle of the night, right? So they could have gunned us down. They could have hired private security guards. That would have been a big cost to them. They could have built the wall a little bit higher. But when we think about non-excludability and non-rivalry, these are almost always a matter of degree. And they're a matter of degree at a particular time. And they are relative to the cost of excluding or of maintaining a condition of equality of consumption. So that's just a, a kind of caveat that I wanted to get out there because many people sort of treat these as discrete categories when in fact, they're probably not fully discrete. All right, so let's, internet connection unstable, it says on the screen, okay. So let's see here. Um, one of the things that people do when they think about public goods is they often think about it as something that's good for the public. And that is a mistake, of course. So the word good is, is ambiguous, obviously, in economics. It just means anything that can satisfy desire. It could be what we would regard as a really ugly painting. Many people would regard it, but one person likes it. Well, saying something is a good doesn't mean that it's good for anyone in particular. And in fact, when we think about public goods, we can think about good and bad public goods, so to speak. So 
the virus, the coronavirus that led to the pandemic now is a public good to some extent, to the extent that it's non-rival and non-excludable. It affects one person, affects just about every other person, at least within their vicinity. It's maybe a local public good and eventually becomes a pandemic, a global public good. Is it good for the public? No. The vaccine against the virus is also a global public good. It's just a, quote, good, global public good, right? We put a positive valence on it. So one of the things that I wanted to flag when we're talking about public goods is that it doesn't necessarily refer to something the state produces, and it doesn't necessarily refer to something that's good for all of us. Having said all of that, those are sort of common confusions. Like you'll see journalists say something like, well, of course, education is a public good. Therefore, the state should produce it. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, there are public goods aspects. I'm going to concede that. But that doesn't mean the state should necessarily produce it for a bunch of reasons. Same thing goes for a, for a virus or for the antidote to that virus. OK, nevertheless, although I flag that, I'm going to sort of assume for the sake of this argument that we more or less agree on this is controversial, but more or less agree on what is good for people. For example, literacy, numeracy, critical thinking. These are all sort of epistemic advantages. We rely on one another in a democracy. If people are illiterate or they can't think clearly, we incur negative consequences to that. So I'm going to refer to public goods for the sake of this argument as non-excludable positive externalities. Cool. So that's the way, again, journalists or somebody who's just toying around with this concept will we'll usually use the word, but I'm going to do it for the sake of argument, even though I think that's actually a mistake in general. You always have to be aware of how it's being used. Okay, so how is education a public good? Well, at least three ways. It can produce more productive workers, which can make all of us better off. So if you think about an educated population like Singapore versus a population like Ethiopia, would you rather be a worker in Singapore or Ethiopia with the same job? Well, you might make more relative wealth in Ethiopia. You would. But you might actually have a better standard of living in Singapore simply because, you know, if you get sick, you're going to get treated better and so on. Right. You're going to have functioning roads and so on. In other words, um, there are real benefits to me of having you uh, better educated, having a better engineer around me or a better architect to build my house, et cetera. Better voters um, and an improved epistemic environment. Just think of what Twitter or any other space would look like if people were a little more disciplined, a little smarter, a little better educated, right? There are positive spillover effects. I'm going to read a quote from Adam Smith on this. So Smith says, in the progress of the division of labor, the employment of the far greater part of those who live by labor comes to be confined to a very few simple operations, frequently but one or two. And he's thinking of the pin factory or one of these classic cases, the man whose whole life is spent in performing a few simple operations has no occasion to exert his understanding or to exercise his invention. His dexterity at his own trade seems to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social, and martial virtues. We become weak and stupid and cowardly, Smith fears, uh, if we're working in the pin factory all day. But in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor must necessarily fall unless government takes some pains to prevent it. And Smith, in this famous passage in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations, then gives what we a view that we attribute to Milton Friedman now, which is something like a voucher view of what government should do. He thinks, well, what government should do is facilitate the education of both the young and the old, actually. He thinks of something like retraining programs and basic literacy and numeracy mm -hmm. For the young and the martial virtues, so you know, it's physical training, I guess. Um, but he says, and he's very clear about this, the state should play no role in establishing the curriculum or enforcing that curriculum. So he has a very strong view that the state should get involved to subsidize positive externalities, we call them. But he thinks they'd probably become negative externalities if they got too involved in the creation of curriculum or in direct teaching. And his rationale is pretty simple. Um, Basically, when you have a third party payer system, that is the government pays the teacher rather than the parent paying the teacher or using a voucher to pay the teacher or something like that, what you end up getting is that the teacher is more accountable to the government than to the student or to the parent. And that was Smith's worry. And of course, that was later on Milton Friedman's worry. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. And so, you know, just to read this slide out really quickly, we have to be careful to distinguish education from schooling. And this is a distinction actually uh, David Schmidt sort of made to me many years ago, but you know, there, there's this popular error where 
journalists will say stuff like, well, those voters, they're uneducated or something like that. And they mean they haven't had like a PhD in economics or something, and therefore we're supposed to think they're stupid. But obviously there's a difference between formal education or schooling on the one hand and education in the deeper sense of being wise and being well-read and that sort of thing. So one of the question, worries, one what's that? question on the differentiation of, of the government providing versus government paying for it. Yeah. One thing that I struggle being a university professor is that who are my customers? Right. So my customers, you know, there's a tendency from students here in the room to think that they are our customers. That, they, oh, you know, I demand a better service. You need to show up at time. They think there's part of that that's true for sure. Yeah. But when I'm making them eat my spinach, you know, like when I teach statistics, it's like, you know, I say, I don't want this. It's too hard. Like, well, you're not my customer right now. The state is my right. customer. Right. Uh, you know, the, so, so um, good. How do you sort of? Put those together in, in, in the setup that you have here. Yeah, I suppose there are going to be trade offs there. So sometimes the state probably is the better, um, I guess you'd call them the customer in this case. Um, it really depends on the assumptions we make on the pe about the people who populate those positions. So are on average state bureaucrats going to be more accountable to what students need, what's good for students, which they may or may not know, than parents, teachers, et cetera. So I think it's just trade offs all the way down here. And in some cases, clearly, I mean, we've all seen this, some, some homeschoolers, certainly not all of them, want to inculcate their children with an extreme ideology. There's no doubt about that. And others are actually trying to fight the extreme ideologies that's coming from the public schools. So, um, yeah, it's just a question really of, on average, who do we trust to get the incentives right? And I think generally speaking, and it really is general, it's going to be the parents and the people paying because they're going to adjust their behavior. If there's a real cost to producing a certain kind of education, a cost to them or their child, generally they're going to move away from those and minimize those costs. Not as true for, for bureaucrats, in my view. OK, there's just two books are, that are examples in which um, you know, Motivated Reasoning with Jonathan Haidt and, well, Nevin Sesserdich wrote this book about philosophers getting involved in politics and some of the crazy things they've done and believed over the last century, including supporting Stalin. Uh, Bertrand Russell apparently did for a little while. Really, really smart philosopher who's don't know about Stalin. You know, uh, you know we, we've got a number of cases where highly educated people can be sophisticated rationalers, rationalizers and poor reasoners. OK, so those would be um, negative externalities to quote education as opposed to positive ones. All right, so providing public goods, just briefly, and, and feel free to interrupt, by the way, ask any questions here. Generally speaking, again, trade-offs all the way down here, we don't want things to be both privately produced and privately financed, right? So, for example, or sorry, um, publicly produced and privately financed, that would be a bad example where, you know, we give all of our money to the government and we say produce everything, right? So I'm going to give you all of my income, now produce all the food and shoes and that sort of thing. So I've got the skeleton over here. Um, often it can be good to, and this is the sort of thing that um, Smith had in mind, um, privately produced but public. Threshold of available schooling, and so we give them a voucher, a loan that's guaranteed by the government, something like that. There are problems with that too, I'll get into it. We could think of, yeah, privately financed, privately produced. That's going to be uh, YouTube videos, you know, private schools, unpatented jokes, et cetera. So this is the usual setup. And, um, yeah, another example of some efficiency gains for privately produced but publicly financed um, is something like, well, the TSA and its alternatives. I would actually put the TSA as up there with the skeleton. Um, when... 2001, when 9-11 happened, a few airports were exempted from relying on the TSA to provide services. And for a while, San Francisco was among those, maybe surprisingly. And there were some tests done about 10 years ago on the efficiency and cost of screening passengers for bringing on board you know, weapons and that sort of thing, explosives. And according to the, uh, to the results, well, what we found is the airports that were exempt from employing the TSA, but still had to meet the same basic standards. Those are universal. Well, they did it in a cheaper way and they did it more efficiently, as you might imagine. Why? Because they can fire bad workers. They're not permanent bureaucrats uh, with the state. And so this is an example in which that can work out quite well. So we have public mandates, but then we have the private provision of how to satisfy those public mandates. Okay, so maybe we can do the same with education. 
All right, so um, yeah, okay, I skipped ahead here basically to that slide so we could think of airport security and think about how the military goes. I mean, that's publicly financed and publicly produced, but everything the military uses is actually privately produced, right? Whether it's the clothes they wear, the boots they wear, the military planes, et cetera, right? And there are problems there because of rent seeking. You know, certainly Raytheon and Boeing, they're often a little too cozy with the government. But my view is it would be a lot worse if the government just produced its own airplanes, right? If they monopolized the production as well as the consumption of those airplanes. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip ahead a couple more slides here and then we'll get to the meat of it. So one worry about this, uh, basically privatizing the delivery of education, even if we have public funding for it, is from a philosopher named Dan Halliday over in Melbourne. And he worries about inequalities. So he worries about, for example, both inequalities in terms of educational outcomes and in terms of access to other social goods and political power and that sort of thing that results from that. And to some extent, he's obviously right. I mean, we know like in Britain, if you go to Exeter or one of those schools, you know, you're, you're um, or Eton, I guess, is the most famous one. You're more likely to end up in Oxford and then in the government. And that's true here for Andover and Exeter and, and some of these other schools. On the other hand, his solution is basically to force everyone into the same public education. I think that's wrong for a bunch of reasons. So he thinks it'll kind of have a leveling effect in terms of inequalities. And he thinks it will tamp down on the pursuit of positional goods where rich parents and therefore rich students want extra degrees just to basically demarcate themselves as, as better than everyone else. Right. So he thinks like by allowing private education, we're facilitating the worthless pursuit of positional goods. What I'm gonna argue is the opposite. What we can do is both tamp down on the pointless pursuit of positional goods, but to the extent that people do pursue those positional goods, there will be compensating positive externalities. And I'll try to say why. Um, okay, so we've got this old debate from the 1980s between Robert Frank and Tyler Cowen in terms of the pursuit of positional goods. And the two big books here are Luxury Fever by Robert Frank, a great book, um, and then uh, In Praise of Commercial Culture by Tyler Cowen. There are others that they've written on. But we can imagine the pursuit of positional goods, like a rich person just wants to distinguish himself from his neighbors. Let's say the Andover Country Club isn't good enough. And so he needs to buy a yacht and then the neighbor buys a bigger one. And Robert Franks makes the, the, the ingenious paradoxical argument that we're doing the rich a favor by taxing them. A big favor, right? Why? Because this is a prisoner's dilemma. It's an endless arms race. And, in a way, he's right. I mean, there, there's some truth to this, right? We can all see this. Oh, you've got a nose job? Well, I'm going to get Botox and a nose job. And I'm going to get Botox in my nose, too. I don't know. Whatever, whatever super cosmetic procedure there is. So I'm going to get a bigger mansion, a bigger yacht, and more Botox, and we're all sort of ugly and unhappy at the end of the day. All right, but if we just tax people and said, hey, focus on your family, chill out, have a good card game with your neighbors, like we'd all be happy, right? Yeah, there's something to that, right? Tyler Cowen says, and, and we can think about some things that he doesn't say too, often the competition in the pursuit of positional goods, and I guess I should define that, a positional good is one, at least allegedly on the surface, where if I have more of it, others have to have less. And the idea is in economics, the pursuit of positional goods is either a zero sum game or even a negative sum game because it requires energy and money to actually pursue positional goods. So I win a medal and then you don't win it you feel bad, I feel good, that cancels itself out. But we also wasted all that time, you know, trying to win medals and worrying about it and losing sleep over it. So we're all worse off, it's a negative sum game. Wait a minute, wait a minute, what about the spectators? What about the, speaking of martial virtues, right? We've disciplined our bodies and mind in competition in the pursuit of those positional goods. Maybe there are compensating positive externalities to this. And that's the, the view that Cowan expresses. We get better music, more science, partly because people are involved in these status games, right? Competition over status. So when we're thinking about positional goods, we can think about negative externalities, but also as when we're applying like John Stuart Mill's harm principle, we're saying, oh, you can't do that because you harm someone. You say, wait a minute, hold on. Were there compensating benefits to that harm? Everything I do has harm. I mean, I tell a bad joke. I have bad you know, cologne or I, I wear a tie that's ugly. Sure, somebody's harmed by everything. The real question is, in total, 
does allowing people to act in ways that sometimes inflicts harm have compensating benefits? And the same thing goes here. We're inflicting negative and positive externalities around us all the time. The real question is, what are the long run effects of different either social policies or licenses to act in certain ways? And, and that's what we're interested in. Okay, so I have, um, let's see here. Yeah, these are three problems with uh, Halliday's view. The first one is this competition one. The second one is signaling and credentials. So Halliday was worried that like, you know, rich kids are just gonna be like pursuing all these credentials for no reason, just to show that they're better than everyone else. Here's a problem though. When the state, the more the state has gotten involved in education, the more it's facilitated these arms races among everyone. So now people who don't want to go to college and might not even be good at it, feel compelled to do it. And when you look at the four year, sorry, uh, going back Carlos to North Carolina, I looked at the data in 2016, the six year graduation rate at the University of North Carolina, not Chapel Hill, but the entire system was about 45%. That's the six year graduation rate. That is the majority of people who went to the UNC system dropped out after six years. That's an extremely expensive and pointless arms race. And now we've saddled them with enormous debt and a sense of shame probably because I couldn't get it done or whatever, whatever their thought is. Who's done that? Is it just leaving people free to pursue their educational aims? Not quite. It's actually giving them, um, well, encouraging them socially, but where do those social cues come from? Often it's because we have like debt forgiveness, we have, you know, subsidies for loans. We have all of these mechanisms that are intended. <laughs> they have really good intentions, right? To, to help poor people get into universities. But the macro effect is it's actually raised the price of universities. And we can measure this over the last five decades. University costs have gone up 500% even after you adjust for inflation. And that seems to correlate really, really well with government subsidies, including, including implicit and explicit loans and so on. So if that's true, although it is the case that we could in principle tamp down on the pursuit of positional goods by just saying most people can't go to college, you're not allowed to, or um, everyone has to go to the same level of public university. Well, we've also implicitly and accidentally created positional goods arms races. So that's one thing that I wanted to mention in response to Halliday. And then finally, yeah, this is about signaling. We have to be careful um, to distinguish honest from dishonest signals. One of the things that happens when more people pursue university degrees that have less value because they feel they need them to enter the workforce is that we get dishonest signals. Now, over time, like in, nat in nature, natural selection tends to call creatures that um, give off dishonest signals. Why? Because predators learn to figure out which prey are sending honest signals and which ones aren't. The same thing goes for Diana, since you're here, mate selection. So generally speaking over time, um, when we're talking about sexual selection instead of natural selection, mates tend to be, or potential mates, pretty good at figuring out which cues are honest and which are dishonest. Um, okay, so over enough time, I think employers end up looking at, you know, which credentials are valuable and which ones aren't. But in the meantime, we can encourage lots and lots of spinning of wheels at very high social cost in order to quote, equalize education. All right, so finally, and this is um, the last couple of slides here. One of the problems with, again, the holiday solution, which is to make everyone go to public schools and not allow private schools, is that we tend to get biased curricula. So that was Adam Smith's worry. Well, here's John Stuart Mill, the objections urged with reason against state education don't apply to the enforcement of education by the state. So we could have mandates to send your kids to school, make them literate and numerate. Nevertheless, he says a general state education is a mere contrivance for molding people to be exactly like one another. And obviously despotism and body and mind and, and all of the worries he had. Many people are surprised by this. Some people see John Stuart Mill as a kind of progressive and in some ways he was. Um, but he really worried that the state would enforce its ideology if it was both the funder of education and the supplier in a monopoly sense. Adam Smith, back to him. So these are some famous quotes from the wealth. Um, I especially like the second one. At the University of Oxford, the greater part of the public professors have given up altogether even the pretense of teaching. They don't even pretend they care. 
the discipline of colleges and universities in general contrive not for the benefit of the students, but for the ease of the masters. Um, they are not well paid masters. Anyone who's spent time at Oxford knows the salary quite low, but they have a lot of leisure time and a lot of good free food. <laughs> um, true, right then. Um, finally, okay. So what I wanted to argue here, and I hope I've been successful, is education definitely does have positive externalities, but it also has negative ones. And as in response to Carlos's question about parents versus bureaucrats and teachers in the state, um, there are trade-offs all the way down here. So um, I think sometimes the state does a better job than parents could of facilitating education. But I think usually when it does that, it does so through, through loans, through subsidies, through mandates, and not through the direct supply of education. But again, there are problems with all these views. I really fundamentally just want to disentangle this view that if something is a public good, um, therefore it should be provided publicly. People have said things like, look, this is so important, it can't be left to the market. And it's like, well, actually some things are so important that you need to introduce market competition in order to discipline the production of that thing. So that's it. Thanks, guys. We can do Q&A or anyone yeah. online. Is there any questions? Question? Question? Yeah. Not, not at the moment. OK. So um, we've got a question back here. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, please, please. OK. Uh, my executive at the A students uh, a couple of years ago uh, had a project, and uh, one of the groups chose uh, educational uh, subsidies to funds in particular. Yeah. And they came up with the brilliant uh, solution, which is to get the universities to come down as co signers on the loan. Mm. I love that solution. So the university would have to pay it back if they couldn't? Yeah, yeah, yeah I like it. Yep. Do you have any thoughts? Like yes, you, that's yeah. my thought. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, then they're on the hook for what they teach as well as who they invite to come to campus and how long they're, they're allowed to stay. Because that's the thing. I mean, the UNC system, and they're not alone. I mean, people are staying a long time. And I, I guess the administrators probably like that. I mean, why not? We're filling our classrooms. So we'll get paid. So, yeah, I love that idea. But then the solutions that come from the state in situations like that, we have had years and years and years of pressure from the state on graduation rates. Yeah. The easy way to do it. Get yeah. In, you get it, you know, you get A's right away. Yeah. Four years worth of A's and you're out of here. Yeah. And you don't have any sort of like, if, if that becomes the only guiding post, right? That's where I think that makes a huge, huge difference, right? Because not only need to graduate them, yeah. but need to do well. Otherwise, you just graduate them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Them. And otherwise, the, the mandatory graduation or, 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 or that sort of thing, I mean, it facilitates, talk about arms races or prisoners' dilemmas, the great inflation problem, right? right. And the proliferation of I'm told that the great inflation happens because our students are a lot better than we used to be. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 right. that's right. Diana. Yeah, so yeah, in in fields like computer science, I know people who got into programming and you you know, you do it an exam or you do a test where you go into programming and then that's an objective view of your quality. And Charles Murray was very controversial for saying that um, what does it cost the US economy for not just giving people IQ tests and instead causing people to have to prove that they're smart um, with, with education. But if there were like more objective criteria for like, I don't know how good a journalist you are or something, then where you went to school and who you know would, would matter less. So yeah. if we were able to make better kind of exams uh, to, to test people on the front end. Yeah, yeah, and this is controversial because I guess this goes back to the early 70s when some courts ruled that by disparate impact interpretation of the law, you can't give IQ tests uh, or things that resemble them because some groups do better than others and therefore you know it's illegitimate so yeah this is a, a thorny issue it has been for about four decades but i think a lot of employers would give them if they were allowed to yeah how about so germany has to be similar to that in their, in yes. their like routing system in the beginning right yep what's the experience like i don't I, you know any sort of like Conclusion yeah, I'm not I'm not an expert on this. I'm more of like a generalist on this public goods topic. I know a lot about public goods, but you know, I'm not an expert on German education. I just know that as as you say, they sift people earlier on. I think there's a big problem with that because people mature at different rates. You know, most 14 year old boys don't want to be poets, but maybe by 24, after some devastating experiences and emotional development, they become good poets or something. Um, you know, so it's kind of odd to sift people in early on, other than at a general level, like high IQ, low IQ or something. 
even that's got problems, but that's probably more objective than some of these other things. Like, do you want to be an engineer at 13 versus a policeman? However, I do think that they have something like an IQ test for college. I mean, certainly something that correlates with it. And that's probably a good idea. If you're going to make college free, that is university education free, as they do, you'd better have some strong sifting mechanisms. And I know they do. So I think they have high graduation rates because on the front end, only the strongest students get into universities. But, yeah. The, the other question, your arms race argument about college. And, yeah. And um, I guess the first question, did you make a distinction between K through 12 and college when it comes to yeah. seeing a distinction that's important to be made between the public good and provision of it between K through 12 and, and, and higher ed? Or not really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have to, it's, any, anytime we have these like, cutoffs, like what's the drinking age going to be, 21 or 18? It's like, oh, well, the brain doesn't develop till like 27. And it's like, yeah, there are all these kind of vague cutoffs. I mean, so I don't have any strong feelings about that. I think pretty clear that everyone needs to be literate, numerate, and have some basic critical thinking skills. Not that that happens, but those should be the fundamental goals of like, let's just call it primary education, which includes, let's say, up to high school. I think after that, then it's like specialist education. And, you know, in the age of the internet, like anyone can read, you know, any piece of literature and any bit of philosophy. And I think people already do, or this is a podcast, whatever. So people are already going to pursue their aims in that regard. And I think increasingly universities should be for specialized education. It's not to say I'm against like liberal arts education, like many of us in this room got that and it was valuable, but the state just has really no role in that, especially now, given what's available. It just seems to me there's just no, there's no reason for it. But. So the idea of a public provision, let's say paying for vouchers, you yeah. would say that sure for K through 12, but not necessarily for higher ed. Basically, yes, exactly. Yep. No subsidy of what's nope. any kind. No, nope, because that subsidy is, is in, yeah, I mean, there's a micro motives, macro effect kind of situation too, where I think the motives were mostly good. I mean, if there are motives that we can attribute to politicians at all, you know, other than re-election so, so on. But like, yeah, there's such a clear um, rationale to subsidize people's college education even, right? Because they're poor, but they're smart. Yeah, we all benefit from that, especially them. But if the macro level pattern that results is an increasing arm rate, arms race among everyone, <clears throat> there's a negative externality on other poor people who aren't as smart, smart as that poor person. And usually, um, we can have situations where there, there are scholarships, you can work while you go to school, which is what I did, you know, I mean, that, that's difficult. I know with like really expensive schools, but the prices would arguably come down quite a bit if there wasn't so much government involvement in the first place. As an example, um, uh, uh, for the year I'm teaching in Ecuador and we have a private school, uh, University of the Americas, and tuition is about $9,000 and people pay out of pocket. Nobody gets money from the government for it. Many of the students are working or they're going part time while they're working. Others have parents who can afford it. Seems to be OK. They don't have rock climbing walls or water slides on campus. So that's sad. <laughs> but, you know, that's not what you need. What you need is the ability to to acquire the skills that will make you better off. All right. So we have an online question. Um, it has been reported that charter schools kick out low performing students to make their image and stats look good yep. slash send them to public schools. How should we as a society deal with this? I agree with that. And this is a problem. Um, and this is the reason I mentioned Paige Harden at the beginning and, and behavioral genetics is one thing I think we don't want to do is measure a school's success by the objective outcomes of the students. You, you can't fundamentally make students who aren't great at math superior mathematicians. You can make them better at math. Um, and we all need discipline when we're learning complicated subjects like this. And the, the reason I say this ahead of answering that question is I think it's a mistake to measure uh, school and teacher performance simply by the objective metrics of how well the students do on tests because we have massive selection effects. And the selection effects occur in public schools, private schools, and especially charter schools. So charter schools, the illusion is, charter schools often will um, do much better than public schools, but it's precisely through selection mechanisms, right? They don't have a lottery for who gets in. They select based on test score or income, which often proxies with test scores. So uh, what do we do about that? 
Well, like in my world, we don't really have public schools or charter schools. We have whatever schools emerge that teach whatever basic curriculum the state or the county sets, plus whatever they want to do. Maybe they focus on the arts or mathematics and science. Um, as long as they've satisfied the basic curricular criteria, then there will be a thousand kinds of schools. And I don't really care what they look like. And we won't know ahead of time what, what they look like. This is a kind of Hayekian point. So, you know, that's a very specific question and a good one. Um, but I, I, I'm after a more radical approach. I think we wouldn't have this problem mm -hmm. if we simply decentralize the provision of education and said everyone gets a voucher. And there are real problems with this. Like local school boards go crazy sometimes. I mean, I grew up, you know, in Southern California and in one district, they taught evolution and another they didn't. And that doesn't sound like California, but it's true. In Orange County, they were giving equal times to creationism and Darwinism. That's a fact, right? And that was the school board that voted on it. Too bad. My view is, you know, these things over time tend to get better when parents get involved in school boards and when the schools are flexible and they're accountable to the parents and not to not to bureaucrats. But again, it's not a magic formula. There are crazy parents out there, no doubt about it. So, yeah. Um, there's another question online. Um, if education is a public good, it seems like propaganda can also be a public good, yep. whether good like a vaccine or bad like COVID. Yep. Is there a legitimate role for certain kinds of propaganda in education? Ooh, wow. So I agree with the premise. Um, I do. I would say no for the conclusion. What a great question. I want to ask this person whether they <laughs> whether they think so. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a problem. One of the one of the arguments I didn't go through, but um, was going to mention along the way is, you know, there's a real problem with like school boards in the United States, as you know, like there's on the one hand, there's this critical race theory stuff and, you know, parents are getting upset about it. On the other, you know, like Biden endorsed critical race theory and then Trump said, no, we need patriotic education. It's like, you're both wrong. You know, like, no, no, no. History should be taught as a science, right? Like things happened in the past. Let's figure out what those things are and let's investigate them like, like we do any other science. But the real problem is we tend to get people pushing propaganda on all sides. And so is there a role for it? I think no, but I'd be interested if, if he or she thought so. But and I just wrote to see if it wants to come off. Yeah. So we sure. mentioned a 45% six year graduation rate. That got me thinking, maybe it makes sense from a, an expected value calculation since mm. people with a college degree earn like a million more in their yeah. lifetimes than without. So if there's a 50% chance it's of good. getting that, yeah. Degree. Like, I don't know what is the expected, like, what do we want to that? Something? Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Um, I have a couple of responses to that. So I don't have like a number in my head. I don't know that anyone's done that exact uh, expected utility calculation, but two points in response. One is often, and I know this is a mean way of putting it, but I did put it that way. We get the proliferation of questionable subjects, and many of them have, I would say, negative externalities, not positive, in order to get people through. So, um, well, when Greg and I were at UNC Chapel Hill, we both has, had offices right next to a woman named Jan Boxel, a very nice woman, but she was involved in one of the biggest scandals in college history uh, with, with sports. And what they were doing is funneling football and basketball players for about 20 some years into, well, it was the Black Studies program. But then it wasn't just the program, but rather they weren't even holding classes. The chair of the department was off vacation in Italy and he'd tell the secretary, give everyone an A. And they just didn't show up to class. And that, that was that was black studies. It was like, OK, the reason for that was obviously they want them to focus on football or they want to improve, improve graduation rates and so on. Why do I mention that? Um, obviously, it's because even if you were right that everyone, you know, 50 percent chance you'll graduate, but everyone's majoring in engineering and doing a really good job at it not just watering down the standards, you know, physics, whatever, even philosophy, right? There's some value to philosophy. Um, <laughs> you know, so Greg, is your PhD in philosophy? Yeah, mine too. Um, it, it can be valuable, but, you know, it depends on what we're talking about here. Are we changing the incentives when we try to get people through um, even at a 45% threshold? And what's the opportunity cost of the money? So we need to measure all of that. And of course, there's the, the kind of Kaplan point, which is... Um, you know, something like, look, obviously we're subsidizing this um, and we're subsidizing it 
if we wanted to do it effectively, we'd want to subsidize certain subjects and not others. So we wouldn't want to just look at the graduation rates. But it's an excellent like conceptual point. You're right. You can't just look at graduation rates and say this is a waste of money. Like 40% could be good. Yep. It's more like this idea of trying to figure out a way to get universities to come down as co-signers on the loan. Like, yeah. is there a room for competition in the market as we see it right now? Like, uh, with legal cases, uh, lawyers can take a case based on contingency if they think that's an awesome case and I'm betting on myself that I could win it because the, you know, the facts on my side. Yeah. Is there an opportunity for university to emerge where they advertise and signal by saying we are co-signers on the loans? Yeah, it's a great point. And I, I think that's that's entirely plausible. Um, these things move slowly like social norms do. So some of us in this room probably know a guy named Stephen Blackwood, who's been trying to start a private university for as long as I don't know that maybe 10, 20 years and nothing seems to happen. He's got some, you know, Ralston College in South Carolina. And it's just like, it's always just about to get off the ground. And everyone's really like behind it and rooting for it. It's like nothing ever happens. So I don't know. Um, it seems like there's an arbitrage opportunity there. Um, but you're competing with legacy institutions that aren't like that, that have brand names, you know, those those longhorns. Platform problem, right? What's that? Platform problem. That's right. Yeah. So I think in the long run, you're right. Um, there's going to be a lot of alternatives that emerge. Yeah. There is a product right now in developed, and it's an insurance uh, based product where they're trying to sell to universities where the university buys so the entire freshman class buys it. Uh, into the, the, the thing that there's an income guarantee five years down the road yeah. on an insurance basis. So, you know, you think about it from you go to Blue College and you sell that to everybody, like you're going to be okay as an insurer. Yeah. You're going you're gonna, to uh, succeed. And, and what that does is they try to then uh, stratify by major. So, what you would the expected income in five years yeah. is going to be something that's going to be done by major. So, to be, I mean, a university that chooses to buy on that, that's sending the signal. Like, we offer all of our incoming freshmen this insurance product. They can only wait for this. You cannot buy it by yourself. It has to be through the university. So, there's four in the big sense. That could be interesting. To see I agree. Yeah. To jump on that. yeah, that's a great proposal. Yeah. Um, I have done. a question just to expand on that. How would universities, if they had a program like that, say somebody? goes to school for social work and somebody becomes a social worker for the uh, government versus somebody becomes a licensed therapist mm -hmm. through that same social work degree for a private company you know you see a different different pay scale there so how would a university sort of try to sift through well they probably wouldn't right so 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 the how idea is that what's, what's on average the insurance company would just look at on average a social worker degree makes after five years and they would promise you that. And they would like say, that, right? okay, we're going to promise the lowest ranking of the salaries or this is what you might become. And you brought the mean should be probably enough mm -hmm. there, right? And then, and then you, you know, some of the people that decide to go below that, they'll get an income guarantee. Uh, right. and, and you might even motivate folks to jump into that line of work, right? They maybe wouldn't do otherwise, the insurance mm -hmm. would the, uh, but the university might, if everybody in their income class decides to go become a social worker as a result of this, that would be too expensive for it. Or yeah, so there's an equilibrating effect. Exactly. Yeah, salary. Not pay that in the to begin with, right? Yeah. Where is that coming from? There's a company in Austin, actually, of all places, wow. that is trying to develop this product. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. We have some well. more questions coming through online as well. Um, can you explain the logic behind the statement that public funding for higher education has led to extreme um, cost escalation? Yeah. Well, this is not my work. I mean, this is this is a pretty well-known result. Um, it's been replicated many times when you now there's the, the causal mechanism, you know, is something you could debate, I suppose. But we see a very strong correlation that as student loans increase, so too and, and, and access to it and Pell Grants and that sort of thing, so too do prices. And we also see a proliferation of all this extracurricular stuff on campus. Right. So, again, when I say water slide parks, I mean, I mean it like there are actual water slide parks at like the University of Missouri and, you know, rock climbing walls and things like this. And so what they do is they're competing, at least the theory goes, they're competing for students with non academic goods or incentives. And, you know, they do it well. So they build better and better dorms. And that's kind of nice. But that seems to be what's going on here. And when you look at other countries that don't have as many explicit and implicit um, 
subsidies for, for going to school, what you see is lower prices. So, you know, it seems like there's pretty good data on this. But it's a pretty straightforward argument of like increased demand, supply is somewhat fixed. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. yeah. No hate mail there. <laughs> no. Yeah. I would have thought. A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay, so we have another one. Aside from anecdotal evidence of football players in UNC Plaxton, what evidence do you have of questionable value of newer fields, um, like policy studies, American studies, urban studies, etc.? Is this the bias of someone who has come through a traditional discipline? Yeah, I mean, so I'm for rigorous interdisciplinary work. Um, what evidence is there for this? This is hard to, you know, this is the kind of thing that I don't know if you publish something on this, you probably get in all kinds of trouble. Um, this is something that I, <laughs> going back to that story, I remember I had had a seminar at UNC and Jan Boxel came, this is the UNC person, and I said to her after class, this is my experience at Berkeley as an undergrad, and I know she had been there too. And I said, Jen, we all know like there are certain classes the football players get like put into and all this. And I was referring to Berkeley and UCLA and our common experiences and it's common knowledge, right? And she just turned pale in the face. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, and look, this is one of those things where if I found a study published that said there are no differences between the disciplines and how rigorous they are, I would strongly doubt the study's replicability. There are certain things, like if I found a study showing the sky was green, it's possible. It is possible. I'll be open to it, but I doubt it. And I think that, you know, I haven't seen any studies in this regard. I think that most people at universities understand that different departments do have different levels of rigor. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I guess that makes me a troublemaker, but I think that's fairly. Will obvious. correlated income be sufficient as a proxy? I don't for, think it's know? sufficient, but, 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 but yeah, indicative. Yeah, right. not only that, but when you look at graduate schools and businesses, they do prefer some degrees over others. Now, a critic might say, "Well, that's because they have some kind of bias or prejudice," but I think, like on average, there are prejudices for smart people who are productive. And, you know, I know that makes me an enemy of some people, but like, I just think that's fairly obvious. So like, I'm not a physicist. I have nothing. I'm, I'm not smart enough to be a physics student, but I know that they get paid pretty well out of school. And I know that law schools look, look highly on physics, um, not because it has anything to do with law, but because they know, I mean, they're right. Like these are smart students coming through. You can't fake that. Um, so. Oh yeah, Greg. And then there's somewhat of a difference between saying some fields are more rigorous than others, some are more yeah. challenging, some are more demanding than others, whatever we make of that, and claiming that some fields are dubious and offering the value. You might think yeah. that um, physics is harder than poetry, I'd say, and that's just that's just yeah. true, but suppose you've done it. But thought both physics and poetry were very valuable to have in the world. So the the the, the example of the Classes for the football players, they don't actually show up in the class. Yeah, yeah. It's well, that's an extreme of a case. Scam, yeah, yeah. You're still using offering any value to the world. Yeah. But it, it's the claims meant to go beyond that there are these scam classes, but that there are whole disciplines that the world would be better off without. Um, you know, that's a different kind of claim than just that those disciplines are less rigorous. It's a claim that they're pseudo disciplines or they're spreading lies or they're. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it just. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. To be to be fair to that point. Yeah. And but there are some that veer more in that direction than others. I will say that. And well, you know, a couple of years ago at Penn, I guess the English department tore down the poster of Shakespeare. I mean, he's a white supremacist. So, you know, that's the English department. You know, that some some disciplines have just radicalized. And so one way to put it is not less rigorous, although I think that is true, <laughs> but more politically radical and less politically diverse than you would need in order to get a good education, where by good, I mean there are positive externalities, not negative. So as an example, you know, some employers I've heard, and I keep track of a lot of my old students from Duke, um, many employers now say things like, there are certain majors that we don't wanna hire from because they're troublemakers. They come here and they go to HR and they try to report everyone for 
microaggressions or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I recognize that behavior. I think we all do. Like, that's a fact. And these are troublemakers. These are not people who are even like sincere, you know, in thinking like, yeah, like this is actually a really morally wrong practice for me to do something. It's like, these are people who are trained to be offended all the time. And I know, again, that's going to strike some as an extreme statement, but sorry, I'm done lying. Like, that's just true. So. You could equate that to, to um, some notions of, we have religious studies department as well. Yeah. Which again, from a scientific point of view where I stand, it's a little difficult to believe in some premises associated with that. And therefore, but but still, they, we tend to be less critical of those. We just find to that was advocate, right? Yeah. And is it because this, we have this one hundred thousand years or more, and therefore we accept that, or or does somehow develop into a more careful, rigorous discipline because of this age and it's a, a, a yeah. And you know, it, it's in some ways, you can make this same. Well, how rigorous can possibly that be? In a university that has physics and mathematics, how can we make study? Of I agree. So I think rigor. So Greg really raised the point, and you're making it, you're pressing it further, and I think that's right. Actually, I have another talk that I almost wanted to give on exactly this called conformity in the cathedral. And it's really about groupthink in American universities. So we have really good data on this. This is something I can give you data on, but I'd have to get my other slides. Um, the political diversity in certain departments, well, it doesn't exist in some, like entire departments. And in others, it's so skewed that it's affecting not only the teaching and therefore it's creating students that, as we might say, have negative externalities because they've never even heard of views that are probably true, right? They're not taught or that might be true. So they don't know how to argue with people who disagree with them. It's worse than that in some disciplines. You know, some disciplines, when you look at just something like registered Republicans and Democrats, which doesn't mean much to me, I'm, I'm not either, but like when you look at the direction it's gone from like two to one, five to one, 100 to one, you know, over the last couple of decades in some of these disciplines, that's frightening. And what that means is that the people who staff the, the journals, that is the editors of the journals, the, the, the research that actually gets published ends up biased, the teaching, the curriculum ends up biased. And so therefore the students who enter and leave those programs don't have a sense of how the world works or what it would be like to engage in a serious way with someone who disagrees with them sincerely. And so that, that's really my worry, I would say. You guys have articulated it better than I did. Yes. Quick. I think we're staying away from the fundamental points because yeah. rather than actually <laughs> zooming out and from a God's eyes perspective, trying to identify what is rigorous discipline and what is not, yeah. if you move the state's interference with education to begin with, and it goes back to, the, the market selecting for what constitutes a rigorous discipline versus yeah. not. Okay, but let me push back on that um, because you might say something like the market doesn't reward a lot of valuable things. Even Hayek agrees with that. And I think it's true, you know. So if people prefer baseball to literature, it doesn't mean baseball is better than literature. Um, so, you know, that's why I'm not a kind of, you know, I might, I'm not a fully free market guy about this sort of thing. I actually think that at least in a, a state with low levels of corruption and decent capacity, the state should play a role. Otherwise, I would just say the state should pull out altogether. So I think markets don't adequately value everything that is valuable. But it's a good question. So you're talk, talking about not, not valuing the monetary sense, people pursue degrees in debt, and therefore those, those, those nuclear are going to exist on campus. More like certain yeah. things that even people don't pursue. Yeah. You want to have the knowledge represented, the knowledge base that yeah. represented on a, on a campus, let's say. And no matter what, if somebody has but the allocation problem becomes very difficult, right? Yep, sure does. So, yep. so you're familiar with that. You want the bureaucrats making that choice? Well, <laughs> and that's that's why I wanted to sort of say, uh, and I've, I've started doing this lately, like, you know, having the following caveat, a state with relatively high social trust and decent capacity may have different obligations than the state without those things. So if you, live in a, if you live in Venezuela right now or Somalia, no, I don't trust the state at all to do any of it. It should just pull out. Of course, it's not going to precisely because it's the kind of state Can it you is. State in the United States on that? Well, we're moving in that direction. So yes, I mean, I think more and more decentralization is called for as social trust falls because people are correct to believe they're actually right now empirically that when the other side gets in power, they're going to punish you. It's like, yeah, they, they definitely are. So do you trust that? Like, I don't. So I think the more you have that, like when social trust goes down, polarization goes up, you need more decentralization. There's no doubt about that. Does Sweden need that? I don't know, probably not. 
And actually, by the way, a good counter argument to everything I just said is when you look at Sweden and Finland, Sweden has had a voucher system for decades. Finland doesn't have one and you get pretty similar outcomes. <laughs> Oops. Um, sorry, guys, I just wasted your hour. Um, no, but, you, you know, there, there are different factors that explain that. And one of the responses I would have is that we're neither. And so it actually really, really matters here. And the bigger we get in terms of sheer numbers, the more multiculturally we get, uh, the more we're saturated with these forces that lead to polarization and division, the more decentralization we need. So the last three decades or four in Sweden and Finland actually aren't that informative for us, although it does say something, which is in like high trust, homogenous, small populations, schooling might not matter as much as you think. And back to Paige Harden, back to behavioral genetics, we probably overestimate the, the actual value of schooling. Brian Kaplan has also famously argued that in his book, The Case Against Education. So, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Great questions. Great questions and good food at the McCoy.